QQRT. And it stands for quantity quality regularity and timing and think of it less like pillars but the four legs of a chair and if any one of these becomes unstable the chair will topple over so i'll probably start with the one that people have heard me bang on about, which is quantity, seven to nine hours. This myth of eight hours is nonsense. It's a wonderful range, seven to nine hours. And what we know is that using that sweet spot of seven to nine hours, when you get less than that, the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Fuck. Short sleep predicts all-cause mortality. Now, we say that there's the minimum of seven hours of sleep. And some people have argued, perhaps correctly, that look, if you look at these mortality curves, there's not much of a percentage difference between sleeping six hours versus the seven that you're telling me is minimum. So six hours is just fine. So all of this nonsense and rhetoric is, is, is silly from you. And I think they've made a conflation because seven hours is the minimum amount of sleep that you need to survive. Because the way that we quantify what minimum is, is based on whether you die or you don't prematurely. The amount of sleep that you need to survive is different than the amount of sleep that you need to thrive. And people will conflate the former with the latter. So you've got to be careful when people are sort of touting on social media saying, well, no, but look, you, there's not much difference between my sort of survival rate on six hours versus seven hours. You may have a, just as much of a long life, but the quality of your life will be very different. So that's quantity seven to nine hours. And is that, does it change for parents, by the way? Because I've met so many parents that seem to be functioning better than me and they've got four, they're having like four or five hours sleep. Did evolution not give parents any leeway or anything when they have kids that suddenly their brain changes and now they can survive with less sleep? The evidence doesn't suggest that mm. once you go through parenthood, you get some magic sort of, you know, immunity shot that makes you, you know, resilient and not vulnerable to a lack of sleep. And in some ways you could argue because we used to, you know, live as a collective tribe and we would share duties at that point, you know, mother nature mm. doesn't really worry too much about you now because you've already procreated and you've passed on your genetic code. So you are now the, the sort of the, you know, oh, the yeah. not particularly well, you know, curd for individual through evolution, it's your offspring Damn. that gets. So it sacrifices you in a way. I mean, that's what we see in the animal kingdom. Did you see that documentary about the octopus? Yeah, it, it was just, I mean, I thought it was a beautiful documentary, but. Um, the TLDR for anyone that hasn't seen it is once the octopus, and I'm going to completely butcher this, so please ignore. Um, once the octopus has given birth, it dies. Basically, it doesn't move out of that hole and it dies. Is that a rough? Well, I don't know if, if it dies, but its level of, of active life. I searched, does the octopus die after reproduction? And it says, yes. Female octopuses die after their eggs hatch. After laying eggs, a female stops eating and devotes all of her, her energy to protecting and oxygenating them until they hatch. Once they do, she dies shortly after, a process called semi parity meaning they re reproduce only once. This death is triggered by hormone changes from the optic gland, similar to mammalian pituitary glands. And males die shortly after mating as well, usually within a few months. That is wild. In some ways, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tragic and it reminds me, I'm so glad that I'm not an octopus. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but coming back to it, so for, there doesn't seem to be some, you know, magic cloak of invincibility that you put on when you go through parenthood. Certainly what we know is that the number of individuals who can survive on six hours of sleep or less and show no impairment in either their brain or their body rounded to a whole number and expressed as a percent of the population is zero. So quantity matters, but it turns out that we got it wrong in thinking that was the only thing because then came quality. So QQRT, quality is 
defined in sleep science as two things. The first is something that your sleep tracker will measure, which is the continuity of your sleep, meaning do you sleep in one or two nice long bouts throughout the night? That's good quality of sleep, nice continuous bouts, versus your sort of sleep is very fragmented by all of these awakenings. That's very poor quality of sleep. And the way that you can measure it in your sleep tracker is just by looking at the app, and there'll be something called sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency is defined as the following. Of the time that you're in bed, what percent of that time is spent asleep? And what we'd like to see is you north of 85% or above. So this is kind of like the user's guide to sleep trackers. What I want to see is 85% or more. If you're less than that, we need to have a conversation. That's number one, good quality of sleep. The second, which is what sort of what you, these trackers can't really do, but I can do in the sleep laboratory when you look like a spaghetti monster because I've put electrodes all over your head. I can measure the quality of your big, deep, slow brain waves of deep non-REM sleep. And that is a second measure, the power of those big, slow brain waves. That's a second measure. And quality seems to be as predictive as quantity in making a difference, not just to your all-cause mortality, but quality even more than quantity when it comes to mental health has been showing the bigger signal. So again, it's not that quantity doesn't matter. You do have to get sufficient amounts of sleep, but quality as much as quantity should be paid attention to. And I haven't said that enough. Mm -hmm. The next is where we came to in our sort of three things that I was saying. The first is digital detox. Then the next thing I said is regularity. This is somewhere where I've also changed my mind on. I've doubled down on regularity. There was a study that also came out of that same data set that I described. It's called the UK Biobank data. And now they didn't look at 90,000 individuals, but they looked at 60,000 individuals. And they decided that they were going to compare and split them into quartiles. So the most regular to the second most regular to then sort of the third most regular. And then the final quartile was those who were the least regular. And what does regular mean in this context? Good question. Highly regular individuals, plus or minus 15 minutes in terms of going to bed and waking up at the same time. In other words, a total oh. wiggle room of 30 minutes. Oh, okay. So if I'm always going to bed at 9 p.m. and I do that five days in a row, I'm yeah. regular timing, really. So, so it's, it's regularity in terms of when you're going to bed and waking up. So it, okay. you're right, it's timing in a way. But okay. I'll come on to why there is a separate T for timing in just a second. But regularity here was, okay, plus or minus. So let's say you go to bed at 8.45 p.m. one night, and then 9, and then 9, 10 p.m., and then you're back to 8. That's beautiful, tight timing. I like that. Whereas the, those people who were least regular, they were 90 to 120 minutes disparate. They were going to bed, let's say, at 11 one night, then 1 a.m. the next night, then they were going to bed at 10.30 p.m., and then they were going to bed at 12.30. They were all over the map. So what they found was that those people who were most regular versus least regular, so they compared the extremes of these two, those people who were most regular had a 49% relative decrease in all-cause mortality. So they were 49% less likely to prematurely die than those people who were least likely to die. They had a 39% cancer mortality risk reduction. Great. They had a 57% cardiometabolic disease risk reduction. So that was stunning. That regularity was incredibly powerful as a predictive signal of your different forms of mortality. That wasn't the best part of the paper, though. They had also measured quantity as well as regularity in these same individuals. So then they decided to say, well, I'm going to take our measure of quantity and regularity, and we're going to put them both in the same statistical bucket and do a Coke Pepsi challenge to see which one wins out in terms of predicting all-cause mortality. We all bet in the sleep field, or at least I did, it was going to be quantity. I was wrong. Regularity beat out quantity in predicting all-cause mortality, and by quite some margin. Now, that doesn't mean that you can now go away and say, I'm going to start sleeping four hours, but incredibly consistent four hours. You need both quantity and quality. But goodness, does regularity seem to carry a massive signal? So coming back to those three things, I would say digital detox, just go to bed and wake up at the same time. 
And the final thing is light. In this modern world, we are a dark, deprived society. We get what I call junk light at night. So you've heard of junk DNA. Well, we get junk light at night. We don't need all of this light and it fools our brain into thinking it's still daytime outside. So no wonder as a society, we have some struggles with sleep at night. Now that's due to many reasons, stress, too much caffeine, alcohol, THC, but excessive light is one of the easiest things that you can do. So for the next seven days, just do me this experiment. If you can set an alarm one hour before your normal bedtime, when that alarm goes off, turn off, and I, I do this myself, turn off almost all of the lights in your house. When you say all of the lights, do you mean the little red light on my smoke alarm or? No, that's fine. But you know, so my wife and I, one hour before bed, almost all the lights, we've got sort of this little set of this sort of light that goes around the television, the back of the television. So it kind of looks like the television's cool and illuminated. I will set that down to about 5% of brightness and all of the rest of the lights out. So you can kind of just still see some illumination. So I'm not sort of, you know, looking desperately uncool and, uh, in, in front of her when I'm tripping over things because it's complete black, you know, then start cooling the house or the room as best you can to around about 67, 68 degrees Fahrenheit or about 18 degrees Celsius. We can speak about temperature, but just do this experiment for the next seven days, one hour before bed, the alarm goes off, you switch off all of the lights and ask the following question, do you feel sleepier? Is it soporific? Does it make you feel more sleepy as a result? But don't stop there. What you've gone and done is the first positive experiment, which is you've gone from the no intervention, lights are on, to then the mats intervention, which is now the lights are off for one hour before bed. Don't just ask, is my sleep better when the lights were out for one hour before bed? Once that seven day period has finished, go back to doing what you were doing before, which is keep all of the lights on and ask yourself, did my sleep get better when I did the intervention? And did my sleep go back to being worse when I stopped? Because I'm trying to teach you bi-directionality in the experiment. Does that make some sense? Yeah, so you get to you get to basically do an A-B test. Correct. Yeah. You get to see both sides of the equation. And with that, it's more proof positive than just one direction alone, because who knows, it could just be a placebo effect. So regularity, coming back to it, is critical. So we've spoken about QQR, quantity, quality, regularity. On the, um, regularity. the regularity point, why? What's mm. going on in our brain that's making it, from a hormonal perspective or other, that's making it important for us to sleep at the same time? It's a bloody great question. People don't respond to rules. They respond to reasons, not rules. So let me try and explain the reason behind the sort of the rule. When it comes to regularity, we have something called a circadian rhythm that we've spoken about. And there's a clock that sits inside of your brain, deep in the middle of the brain. So we have, it just turns out, a brain here. Lovely, okay, so. We've got one of these hemispheres here, and then I'm just going to take out what we call the subcortical sections. So these are the areas that are below the subcortex. So here is the brain. So this is the front of the brain, the back of the brain, top of the brain, and here's the brain stem. And it turns out that right in the middle of the brain, right here, there's an area called the hypothalamus. Now here, this structure here, this is the thalamus. This is the sensory gate of your brain. So all of your five senses, sound, touch, taste, smell, they all flood into this gate called the thalamus. And then the thalamus will decide whether it sends those sensory signals up to your cortex. And when it sends the signals up to your cortex, you start processing them and you become consciously aware of the external world. Now, as we're falling asleep, just as an aside, what's interesting is that this gate, the sensory gate, the thalamus, once we start to fall asleep, the gate will close shut. Now your eyes are technically still seeing, your ears are still hearing, your tongue is still tasting, but because the gate of the thalamus, the sensory gate closes shut, those signals that are coming into your brain are no longer sent up to your cortex. So you stop perceiving the outside world, which is just simply a different way of saying you've fallen asleep. Now the hypothalamus, you've heard of hypo, sort of hypertension or sort of, you know, hypothermia, that means lower. So here's the thalamus. This area here is called the hypothalamus. 
And it's a tiny structure, but within that structure contains a nucleus. And that group of cells, the nucleus, has a fancy term, and it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. But the suprachiasmatic nucleus is your master 24-hour clock. Every cell in your body has a clock inside of it. But this is the master clock. It's like Lord of the Rings. There's one ring to rule them all. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one clock to rule them all. And here in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, you get the 24-hour rhythm of being awake and being asleep, being awake and being asleep. How does your brain keep quartz-like precision 24-hour clock time? How does it do that? The way it does that is that it uses signals such as light and from, dark. From, from your eyes. From your eye. And so when light comes through the retina, it tells the hypothalamus it's daytime and therefore you should be awake. And its rhythm starts its awesome sort of upswing. And temperature can do this and feeding can do this, all sorts of different things. But for the most part, light is the principal governor that essentially acts like electrical, I should say, photon fingers that pops the wristwatch dial out and resets it precisely to so 24 hours every single day. Because if you're left in the dark with no signals of light, your clock isn't precise. It drifts to about 24 hours and 15 minutes. So you start going forward a little bit every single day if you go into a cave, and people have done this experiment. The thing that keeps it precise is light. So you need light to keep a beautiful 24-hour rhythm. One of those things that's under the control of your 24-hour rhythm is your sleep-wake cycle. What if I'm doing exercise? Exercise is a wonderful entrainer of your circadian rhythm as long as you're doing it at the right time. So if you're starting to exercise at three or four in the morning, that's not good because that's an activity signal that's going to confuse the brain into thinking it's the active period, which is normally because we're a diurnal species, the day. And it's the same thing coming back to my point of regularity, using light as the best way to help with that regularity because light, if it's artificial at night, fools your brain into thinking that it's daytime still outside. I mean, is there any such thing as non-artificial light? I mean, I guess with the sun, but I mean, is there a type of light that I could use at night, like candles or something? Or Yes, below 30 lux, Right. is not going to necessarily do you a disservice, probably below 50 lux. Now, lux, L-U-X, is just a measure of light intensity. And you can download on the App Store a free lux meter. And if you're an idiot nerd like me, you're going all over the house at night and you're sort of putting it in different locations, you're seeing oh God, is there any kind of white spots here where, you know, the lux is too high. But you need to drop that, that lux. By the way, it's a great way if people want to say, look, my REM sleep is deficient. How can I get more REM sleep? There was a great study where they did something similar to what I'm telling you now. 90 minutes before bed, they turned down the lights to below 30 lux and they pulled out all of the blue light. And just that trick of dropping the lights down 90 minutes before bed, below 30 lux, making it warm yellow light, increased their REM sleep by 18%. Wow. It's a huge margin, so no need for pharmacology. But to your question, why is regularity important? Well, I told you that light is one of the signals that can create regularity. It turns out that your behavior is another thing that will tell your brain. So meaning when you go to bed and wake up at the same time, it acts like an anchor. It anchors your circadian rhythm. And it tells you almost like a scene in a movie, this scene is now complete a new scene starts. This scene is complete, a new scene starts. So every time that you're going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, you are feeding the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the master 24 hour clock in your brain. You're feeding it signals of regularity. And when it feeds on signals of regularity, it improves the quantity and the quality of your sleep. Your circadian rhythm likes consistency. It likes regular signals. When you feed it signals of light, of activity, of waking up, going to bed, you improve the quantity and the quality of your sleep. That's the reason behind the underlying rule. So having a TV in your bedroom is a terrible idea then, because if on that behavioral point, if I'm getting in bed, but then I'm staying up for three hours watching Netflix, my brain is going to be quite confused about like, 
the behavioral pattern of what, of what I'm doing in my life. It's not going to associate the bed with sleep. It's going to associate the bed with movies. That's one of the problems that we call, con it's called conditioned arousal, 